Hi, my name is Yasmin Terehi, and this is Startup Confessionals, where we interview startup founders and entrepreneurs in the Middle East and Africa. We'll learn about some of the biggest lessons these founders discovered on their journey from the personal to the professional and share how they keep themselves motivated. Today's episode is with Amir Alam, the CEO and founder of El Menus, a food discovery platform with over 12,000 restaurants and over 1.5 million monthly users. Their mission is to share the best dishes in each city in the region by combining a social, visual, and personalized experience to help connect restaurants with the diners. Amir is also an ex-internationally ranked squash player, computer science grad, and he started El Menus out of a love of food, technology, and curiosity in building impactful products. So Amir, thank you so much for joining the show. Thanks, Yasmin. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here. Great. Yeah, likewise, likewise. So Amir, can you briefly share your value proposition in your own words with our audience? Sure. So so El Menus basically is has been set out from day one to help people with what we believe is like one of the most existential questions that people globally face, which is what will I eat today? It's a question that people ask themselves uh, at least three times a day. And whenever they ask that question, they don't necessarily get answers that help them uh, find the best food there is uh, that they would, would, would like to order. So, so in menu's vision is basically to help people discover and order the food they will love. Uh, And we do that through an experience that's social uh, and personalized, and more importantly, also that uh, we have a seamless ordering experience to help deliver that uh, food or their discoveries in a seamless way. Wonderful. So, can you walk us through a little bit about how the platform works? So, I'm, you know, in Egypt. I'm craving lunch from maybe specific type of food or a specific type of restaurant. Uh, walk us through the platform. So, so basically, El Menus has a comprehensive directory of more than twelve thousand restaurants. Uh, you would be able to look up any restaurant with all their info, including telephone numbers, map locations. Uh, more importantly, of course, uh, are the actual menus with all the pictures. So if you are setting yourself out to find uh, a good dish today to uh, to discover and, uh, and order, you will get into the platform, search for any restaurant that you want, search for any dish that you want, or you can just discover uh, using our dish filter, which, which helps you see all the pizzas or the burgers or the sushi uh, places around you uh, on the dish level. So you actually see the dishes, not only the, the restaurants. Oh, that's great. Why did you start this company? I mean, what was the pain point that you felt you were solving for? And you started this in 2011, correct? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, I started that uh, like like most startups out of a personal problem. Like I used to go out a lot and like, um, uh, you know, uh, take a take a, a shot in the dark on like what kind of restaurants would I like to go to, um, and and so I figured out wh- why does it need to be such a painful process? Like people can comfortably see all the information before they head out to to a restaurant. Mind you, now it's it's a it's something people take for granted. But like in 2011 in Egypt, there was there was no directory that had all the menus and all the information and reviews about uh, what kind of restaurants are around them and and what people think of them. Um, so, so, so what we set out to do is collect all the information in one place, uh, surface the best dishes in the city by getting people to rate, uh, and, uh, and mention what are their, their most favorite dishes, uh, uh, um, in the, in the city that they're in. Um, and so we were able to get other people to recognize what should they order when they go to a place or what should this, what should they discover when they, when they set out to, to find uh, a meal today. So, so, so discovery was essentially the pain point that we were solving for. Um, and then we evolved more into an ordering platform. That was a natural next step for us. Ordering was also a very painful process. People in Egypt were used to order uh, food via the phone and, and they couldn't find a way to get their, their food in an easy way and in a, in a seamless way. So, so, so we pivoted into being an ordering platform. So not only can you discover your best dishes, but also order them. Uh, and get that food arrived in a quick way to you. So Amir, when was the moment that you realized that you had product market fit, you know, and, and who are you catering to? Like, is it everyone and anyone in Egypt or were you catering to a specific demographic at first? 
what was, yeah, the moment that you realized that you had product market fit? So we we had a lot of those moments, like product marketing, market fit was a, was a continuous thing at El Menus. The first one, of course, was how many restaurants do we need and what kind of info would be adequate enough so that when people would, would go onto the platform, they would find all the answers that they need. So using a lot of like, you know, MVP principles, I didn't even know what the word means back then. I was just, I was just basically um, uh, calculating for effort. So, 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 so what I did is, is that we, we, we prioritized the top uh, 150 restaurants back then that people would most search for. Uh, and we launched with those. And then on the third month of launching with only those restaurants, we got around 30,000 uh, uh, sessions per month. Um, and then it went like much more accelerated from then on because it was a side project was very small as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a company, we didn't even have a company. Uh, and, uh, and we, we decided that, you know what, probably people need this and we need to get more restaurants on board. So our growth was, was fueled by digitizing menus of more restaurants. Um, and, and today we have over 12,000 and, and that basically keeps everybody, uh, uh, as a user, um, uh, uh, knowing that the, the the platform is reliable enough that they would find any restaurant that they want very quickly, so so that was the first moment for us is that get, getting the selection right, getting being very comprehensive. Um, the, the the second moment for us was understanding that uh, uh, social is a very important uh, uh, thing for the product because when users get in, of course, get, finding the restaurants that they want is important but they would need to find not only reviews on the restaurants, but actually what kind of dishes would they eat if they actually land on, on that restaurant. So we introduced ratings on a dish level. Very few platforms have, have done that at that time. Um, so when we did that also, people would not just answer the question of where will I eat today, but also what. Uh, and that for us was very insightful because we knew from back then that dishes is the way to go. We need to make it a very dish centric platform um, and to, to this day, we have a very dish-centric platform where people can go in, find all the dishes in their area, and find all the, the photos as well. Again, not, not every platform does that. Most of the platforms operate on a, on a restaurant level. So, so, so that was another huge product fit moment for us where people uh, would get into the platform, find better answers for, for what will they, would they, will they eat. And of course... Then uh, ordering was another fit where we had to figure out the right experience, how to create a great customer support experience and make the, the process short and quick enough so that in the least clicks possible, you would get your order delivered to your home. Uh, and we were, we were basically competing with the phone because in Egypt, most people actually order by the phone. Uh, and, and for us to nail that experience, we, were, we had to be much more better than, than, than what would, they would do uh, when when they order their food on the phone. Wow. I love that you introduced the dish rating. I, I've never actually heard of that. And I think that that's such a common question that people ask when they go to restaurants, like, what's the special? What do people usually like here? And it's always yeah. such a strange experience because sometimes you get like a waiter um, who will tell you what their favorite dish is, but not necessarily the aggregate favorite dish. And sometimes you'll get someone who will, but it's just, yeah, I think that that's really a powerful differentiator I haven't seen in the market today. So wow, bravo. Um, Amir, are you guys planning to expand beyond uh, your current market? What, what are your sort of plans for the future? Of course, we, we believe that uh, Egypt is, is definitely a big enough country for us to, to you know, continue uh, growing into, dominating, provide more services for the users and the restaurants alike. Uh, but in Egypt, we, we figured uh, uh, the right formula for um, um, the, the demographics that are, are very unique to, to Egypt and, and a lot of underpenetrated uh, countries as well, which is... Uh, around 7% of the Egyptian population, for example, are ordering actually online. The rest is, is doing their orders uh, on the phone. So, 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 so basically, um, there's a lot of other countries, especially in Africa, uh, that also have the same problems and challenges. The restaurants need more education on how to go digital. The users have still not believing in that an online experience would be better than the, than the phone. And they also uh, need more restaurants to be online and the selection to be better so that they would adopt uh, their behaviors to, to an online experience. 
So, so we believe that nailing Egypt, growing it further, giving the restaurants tools, data, and products to help them scale would allow us to easily uh, grow into other countries where the same problems persist. And then, of course, when that happens, the the the, the whole world is, is an option for us and we can expand further into, into so many other countries uh, because of our unique take uh, on the market. Mm, fascinating. You've been around for a while, Amir, and... I'm sure you face a lot of adversity and maybe struggles, um, things that you had to overcome over the last 10 years and especially over this last year. So I'm curious, you know, what are moments that, you know, really challenged you and challenged the core of your, of your industry and your company and how did you overcome it? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. I think a lot of um, founders, CEOs, don't really talk about this uh, a lot. Um, I think it's super important because if you're not personally scaling and the leadership team is not personally scaling well, it really affects the how the company's growth uh, is bottlenecked, right? So, so I think one of the things that I've learned is that um, what motivated you on day one is definitely not going to be the same motivator uh, on day ten thousand. So, so I think one of the one of the most important things is to keep growing, uh, renew your your motivation, renew your purpose, uh, figure out what personally is, is is something that you've thought you've uh, you know were 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 um, uh, motivated by, and and renew that curiosity and your passion for for learning new things. So, so for me on day one, I was just trying to fix a problem really, uh, and 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 created a company just just to solve that problem and and the pain that. Personally, I I had, and I think most of the startups start out uh, that way. Um, and then over time, it became more a, a curiosity of understanding how, how products can scale, what kind of things that we need to do for users that would really create a different differentiated experience for them. Uh, what kind of things can we create for different stakeholders in the system like restaurants? Um, and, 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 and throughout time, I've become more curious about building organizations, building the right culture, figuring out how to hire the best team possible. And of course, behind that, there's so many failures and lessons that that, that I have learned. Uh, and uh, and I faced times where, where there was, of course, no motivation at all to, to keep things uh, going on. And that's super uh, uh, natural for, for it to happen. And I talk with so many founders where, where this becomes a norm, right? To go through burnouts, to go into cycles of uh, ups and downs. But the most important thing is is to always um, just challenge yourself and and be curious about uh, uh, so many things because a startup at the end of the day, as much as it solves a pain and it's uh, um, a way for you to solve uh, an experience problem for your users uh, or your stakeholders, but it's also a great vehicle for uh, um, to create a great community of people uh, and employees uh, and people who share experiences together and grow together. So, so I think that was for me a huge driver throughout the years. Is 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 basically renew my curiosity over a lot of many different topics uh, within a startup. So it becomes a vehicle at the end of the day to grow yourself and explore so many things. And uh, of course, chief amongst them is is as again I always bring it to that solve a user's uh, problem. That's really powerful, Amir. Thank you so much for that. It's very inspiring to just to renew your curiosity and how that curiosity kind of shifts over the course of the of the startup. So I think people will appreciate that. Amir, what about uh, some of the priorities that you had um, with raising money and how the opportunity cost of raising money related to you know, your business, like how do you manage both? I, I think that to me, that's always so fascinating when I talk to CEOs and founders who, you know, have to focus on business metrics and revenue and uh, raising money and then also managing a company, hiring people. How do you balance those two things out? I'm not an, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this. <laughs> I honestly <laughs> struggle with that all the time because like running the day to day and keeping your head um, you know, on the on the on on fundraising and and also talking to uh, to investors at the same time when you're probably having so much uh, challenges in the background to 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 help scale the company, it's it's a very intricate uh, uh, balance to solve for. Um, but but I think the things that I've learned is that a 
um, uh, the, the fundraising is a process, and 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 that process is something that you can uh, uh, learn how to improve and to make it more efficient, um, and and use it also as a learning experience. So one of the major things I've learned in in especially in the later stages. Um, is how to create good feedback loops from the people we talk to uh, and internalize those learnings into the company and to the to the teams. So, so when we treated fundraising as such, uh, it was actually very eye-opening, the amount of insights we get from global investors. We've talked to people who've invested into our space and did this thing over and over in so many other uh, countries and so many other regions. Um, and 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 when we treated as as a learning experience, we were also able to 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 shape our strategy and be more agile to it, rather than looking at it as a as a process of getting a yes or a no. It is at the end of the day a process of getting yes or a no. But if you treat it as a learning experience, it actually helps you with with your day day to day uh, uh, inner workings and and challenges. Um, and and I think that was very helpful to our teams as well because when 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 we are drifting off and like maybe using 30% of the time to to fundraise, the team knows that we're also going to bring them back insights. So our time is is also well uh, utilized. Um, and and the other thing is is also uh, if I would you know go back in time and tell myself some advice about fundraising, I would say be very honest about what kind of time this will take because it always is a drag and always takes more time than what you think it, it will. Uh, and allocating that time from the start and being transparent about your uh, about that time allocation with your team helps them support uh, your process and, and your time and understand why you might not be as available as uh, when you are not in fundraising mode. So, so I think th- those are the learnings to, to balance out between uh, both of those processes. Mm, yeah, that's powerful. So yeah, I think transparency, like being really transparent with, transparent with your um, workforce just goes a long way. I love that. I think a lot of companies try to hide what's going on at the executive level. And then, you know, there's such a disconnect in communication. So I think that's really powerful to share that with your team so they know what's happening. 100%. Yeah. 100%. I've actually, I've actually seen some, some companies uh, create a process from the start where their team is actually more involved. So that when the time comes, they're, they're, they're not able to just showcase what the company is doing, but also what the team is doing and get them engaged into the process, not not only on the top management level, but uh, on, on even the middle management and, and beyond. Um, and this is something that I think a lot of investors also appreciate, right? They're not investing only into a product or a company or or, or the or the exact level. They're also investing in a good culture and investing into teams that can execute well. So also being transparent and visible and giving them that visibility helps with, with, with such a process. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Amir, I wanted to ask a, a, maybe an unconventional question, but I think it, it tells a lot about where a person is at mentally. And so I'm curious, what do you spend most of your day and time thinking about? It could be business, it could be, you know, personal, but, you know, to get into the head of, I think, someone who's running uh, a company with so many people and so many users, I'm really just curious, you know, what do you spend most of your days thinking about? Um, How are you managing your, let's say, inner world or your emotional world? Do you mean what what kind of challenges uh, keep me up at night, so to speak? Yeah, it could be a mix of things. It could be like, what are the things that are keeping you up at night? Maybe like, what are the things that you want to work on? Like, how are you supporting yourself? Like, how are you taking care of yourself to be able to, to lead the company to? Because I think like as as uh, people grow within an organization, it probably, you know, there's there's a lot of demands that, that come uh, over a period of time. So I'm just curious if like, there's anything you're setting yourself up for, like things that you want to learn or like things that you're just thinking about. Um, it could be anything really. <laughs> yeah. No, I think on, on, on one front, the, the, the main challenges for me and, and the things that I keep constantly thinking about, thinking about and reviewing, um, is honestly people, uh, in, inside of the, the company, uh, like, are we doing enough to get the best talent out there? Are we doing enough for the people that are already in the team and motivating the the right people and giving them the right support and, and systems and resources to be able to perform at their best and innovate and challenge uh, what's what's already being accepted as a status quo, whether in the market or inside the company? 
Um, so for me, I'm I'm always very uh, uncomfortable being in in a, in a comfortable place. So I, I I really try to always challenge what I believe is 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 something that is working and and trying to figure out how to make it work in a in a better way. And I think that's might be the engineer inside of me and maybe might be uh, just trying to make things better. But but I think on one part it's it's people. Two is 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 of course the product. I'm a, I'm a product person by nature. And uh, I think uh, a lot of the times, what would I always want as a user, as a as a as a restaurant owner, as a as a as a driver uh, into our ecosystem, and try to put myself into those stakeholders' shoes, and 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 I don't like to ever settle that I have figured out what 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 kind of problems or solutions that are that we are basically delivering to those stakeholders. So I think that's another thing that I always try to uh, keep my, my, my um, be on my toes on. Um, and I think on a, on a personal level, it's, it's important that, you know, with, with that kind of, uh, with those kind of challenges, with the company that grows so much, um, personally as a, as, a, as, a, as a leader or as a founder is that uh, I try to refresh and and re- revamp my assumptions about what I know and what I don't know, um, and I think that takes takes a lot of internalization. And the best founders and the most successful people I've talked to are people who are able to you know uh, challenge their assumptions every now and then, challenge their assumptions about everything. Uh, and I think with that, you're able to really uh, uh, refresh your worldview and what you think you know about yourself and what you think about you know about other people around you. And when you do that well. Uh, you become a little bit more vulnerable, more humble, and and hence be able to grow in a in a much more healthier way. Uh, and I think that expands to to so many uh, ways on a personal level. So throughout the years, uh, I was able to to do that through basically figuring out how to challenge my even on a small scale challenge my diet, challenge my habits on terms of like what kind of workouts do I do. And I think all of these things matter. Like the micro is, is is so much interrelated with like the macro. So whatever habits you do on a daily level and how you enhance your, you know, productivity and how you enhance your well-being also uh, spreads out to how do you do you scale as a company and how do you uh, uh, treat others around you in a in a, in a much more uh, renewed uh, version. If that makes sense, uh, I'm, I think I'm, I'm being a little bit philosophical there. I love it. Yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. I I love that you kind of, you know, take away and remove your assumptions and kind of almost like destroy and uncreate your original mode of thinking to to open up space for new ways of maybe experiencing reality because I think that I think that that's what I've seen because I've, you know, worked with a lot of different companies over the years and so many different founders and so many different products and I think what I see a lot of companies, uh, you know, have a bottleneck on is uh, the executive team's inability to kind of um, start over, like in terms of their their uh, way of thinking about the product, the product roadmap, the industry, the ecosystem. So oftentimes, someone who's not even in the ecosystem could just see something so clearly about what's happening in the product roadmap that they might need to tweak. But people that are, I think, so attached to something, um, I've jokingly said that even product managers sometimes are really not the right people to get customer feedback and research uh, to inform the product roadmap because they're so married to their idea. It's kind of like their baby, right? And nobody wants someone to tell them like their baby is ugly. Like they just shut down. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a situation that really um, invites opinion. So I, I love that attitude of yours. And I think it's incredibly powerful. And of course, I mean, you've been in the business for so long. So clearly you know, you're a, you're a world-class leader. So Amir, I wanted to ask uh, one more question before uh, having you provide us with your main takeaway. Um, I think it's interesting to just to get a window into what people are reading. And so uh, what is the last book that you read? And maybe what's your favorite book on business or a book that maybe just inspired you? Yeah. Yeah. It's a tricky question because I actually... Throughout time, I've I've learned that my learning style or reading style is that I would read a couple of books at the same time. I, I'm not a person that is able to finish one book and get to another one. So at any point in time, my Kindle has like around five books lying around. 
uh, in uh, simultaneously. So, 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 so I think one of the one of the the last books that that was really eye opening for me. So it's actually the motivation myth. So, so this was a book I was reading a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it was super enlightening for me and super enlightening also for, for, for how to lead teams and how to lead other people that think motivation is, you know, about that moment when you've achieved something really big and dropped that big project with so much big numbers and, 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 and all that uh, shebang. But like motivation is, is like really uh, about very small successes, very small uh, also learnings on a daily level and the discipline that comes with that. Um, and that that was a very eye-opening book for me because uh, I'm, I myself am very competitive, very, uh, uh, you know, person that, uh, I'm a person that challenges themselves a lot. Uh, and I always uh, favored like big wins and like big successes, but focusing on the mini successes is all what uh, uh, gets you up, worked worked up on, on, on like the bigger um, uh, motivation on a on a weekly and a monthly level, so so that was one of the books I was uh, uh, reading uh, uh, recently. One of the I think the, the the nicer books that I've read in the maybe last year or two was uh, the hard thing about hard things, um, and uh, and I think that that uh, that book got a lot of wide adoption recently among the startup community. Uh, and the good thing about uh, about it is that it doesn't you know it's not like one of those startup self-help books where where you're discussing very generic things or like looking at things from a, a point of view of someone who's been really successful in and doing a blog article or, or like a, a book for just the sake of self-promotion but getting into the the details of what makes a startup work and what is the nature of in the different phases of a startup uh that really lead up to uh making something out of uh, nothing so so I, I would on top of my head uh i think there are so many interesting reads and, and books uh, lying around but I, I would say these are the ones that come uh, across uh, at the moment amazing yeah i loved uh the hard things about hard things that was one of my favorite books um you know about the startup space and growing a company and yeah ben horowitz uh, yeah and i will also check out the motivation myth i just uh, will add that to my queue <laughs> So yeah. thank you so much, Amir. And what's your main takeaway, like your kind of last, you know, takeaway that you want to tell our audience? I think, I think what I've, what I, the, the, the lesson that's stuck with me recently uh, amongst uh, a lot of other things is that um, a lot of the time you, you discount your intuition, especially uh, uh, sometimes when, when the company grows at a scale where things, you know, a little, get a little bit structured uh, and you need to provide a lot of data for when 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 you want to move on to a certain product line or a new problem that you want to solve. Um, and there is, I think, no substitution for for being in the shoes of the people you're solving the problem for. Um, and that that lesson keeps hitting me every you know uh, every single uh, day. Is that um, there there is honestly not nothing more important than that. Um, because because then you 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 follow your intuition on on a lot of small details which make up a lot of the successes uh, that you go through um, and and when you figure the right balance between following your intuition getting some data to support that and building on top of uh, uh, building on top of that to 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 you know to have some uh, let's call it grand A B testing uh, on a lot of the ideas that you have and you and the team. It's uh, it's really uh, mind-boggling the amount of things that you can you can reach, um, and when we compete with companies that don't do that, we really understand how much power there is when when you have a team and you and you per personally are trying to solve a problem that you yourself feel. So 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 a lot of the times when I've felt that this is a problem I want to solve, uh, and thought maybe at some point I can't give enough data to support or like uh, figure out how that uh, is really the major problem that we, that we should tackle i get surprised by seeing some other startup in some other parts of of the world where they have taken the risk of figuring out that this could be actually their only uh, problem or their only obsessional focus so 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 honing the talent or the skill set of being able to figure out the balance between what your intuition says the kind of problems you want to solve for people and 
putting yourself uh, putting yourself into their shoes is, um, is 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 for me extraordinary and 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 that's how you achieve um in in my opinion great scale mm, i love that that's very very inspiring as well um yeah, I think not enough people know how to see the world from other people's eyes. So, and just em- empathize with with what other people are going through. So it's just a great practice in general. So, so actually, one of the first values that we have in the company is hunger empathy. So, so this is the main value that we're after. That's what we call it. So, empathy towards our users, whomever they are, whether they're restaurants, drivers, or users. Um, is how we in 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 the menus basically uh, are able to develop and and focus on the smaller things and being able to validate that these are are important enough for our users, uh, and also take that to to scale. Amazing, amazing. What are some ways that people can get in touch with you, or if they want to learn more about you? Where are are re- are there any resources that you can point folks to? So I'm 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 actually pretty active on 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 LinkedIn in terms of I, I respond to literally almost everybody that that uh, that uh, that reaches out. Um, I, I I do it as a, as a as a as a practice that I would not skip anything that 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 anybody reaches out for, whether it's for like pure networking, taking uh, you know mutual learnings from each other or sharing experiences. So I'm I'm really active there. I used to I used to be more of a blogger but that failed really quickly and didn't have the time for it but i think that's something that's on my (laughs) on my plans so but but yeah linkedin for now amazing well thank you so much for your time amir this was a very inspiring conversation i think a lot of people will really you know walk away with motivation for whatever idea that they want to maybe take to market so thank you again no i appreciate it thanks for having me Uh, And thanks for keeping this podcast alive. It's super useful and super insightful uh, for so many people. Thank you, Amir. And for our audience, thanks for joining and for listening to Startup Confessionals. 